There, there's a principle of physics, in fact, that says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, our physical world is just a copy of the spiritual world. It's not more real. And those same physical principles have a counterpart in the spiritual realm. We tend to think of blesses and curses more as a fantasy. More, most, more people are willing to believe in blessings, but are far more skeptical about curses. We like to celebrate the positive. We tend to associate curses with some sort of a superstitious practice from the dark ages. And I would submit to you quite honestly that I think that thinking is unrealistic. It's illogical, it's irrational. We can't focus exclusively on one aspect of opposites because it's, it's acceptable to us and then simply ignore the other because it's unacceptable. We're wiser than that if we'll stop for just a moment. The opposite of hot is cold. Both are real. The opposite of good is evil and both are real. In the same way that blessings are real, so are curses. And it would be in our best understand, interest to understand them a bit more. I would submit that many Christians who should be enjoying blessings are actually enduring curses in their lives. And this is just an introduction, so it's a bit oversimplistic, but there's a couple of primary reasons I believe that's true. The first is the most obvious. We simply don't know how to recognize what a blessing or a curse is. We're not even aware of the categories. It's not like understanding that a virus exists. All you could track is symptoms and you would have no understanding whatsoever about cause or cure. And many, many, many Christians live in that condition. And then secondly, if they happen to be under a curse, they don't understand the basis upon which they could be released. So they just understand that's their life, their role, their circumstance. That's how things happen for them. The sources of curses are something we understand little or think about less or talk about almost never. When it comes to blessings, the Bible says God is the sole source of the, those, that every good gift comes down from our Father of lights. Curses, they may proceed from God, but he's not the only source. We'll look at that in a bit more detail. And then we live with this fallacy, this mistaken notion that there's a, an enormous gulf between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Some sort of a dualism where God finished Malachi and he took an antidepressant and he chilled out. <laughs> you know, in the Old Testament, we often, you, you'll hear people talking, they've stood on this platform and said, I don't like to read the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament kind of Christian. That's called deception. In the Old Testament, God is so often presumed to be a God of wrath and judgment. In the New Testament, we, we just presume that he's a God of mercy and grace. But we do that because we're unaware of the scripture. Look at Romans 1 and verse 17. It's in your notes. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith and from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Many of us know that verse. Fewer of us know the very next word, verse. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. Last time I checked, Romans was still tucked in the New Testament. And it talks both about the a gospel of righteousness and the mercy and grace of God and the wrath of God. To obtain an accurate picture of God, we must always keep both aspects of his character before us. His blessings proceed out of his kindness, but his judgments proceed out of his severity. And here's the important note, both are equally real. And our life plan for dealing with God, for interacting with God, with understanding God, with serving God, for being God's children, it's important to know his character. Let's push it a little further and talk for just a moment about the significant of a cur significance of a curse. When Moses is preparing the Hebrew slaves to move into the promised land, that's an intimidating task. Moses is assigned leadership over a group of people who have been slaves for 400 years. So they have no memory of self-determination. They have no stories to tell. They've never been a nation. They've never occupied a piece of ground. They've never had a capital city. They never had a central authority over them. They have been slaves for all the memory that they have. Those are the stories they can tell. They started as a family that moved into Egypt and they flourished. And 
until they threaten the Egyptians and finally they're enslaved and it's this mixed multitude of people. And God says to Moses, I want you to lead them out of slavery and into the promised land. And through some rather dramatic interventions of God, they're released, the Egyptians drive them out, and now Moses is left with this enormous group of people. They have no social systems, they have no infrastructure, they have no form of worship, they've been slaves. And that's what the books of Deuteronomy and those fun books to read, we're getting ready to start them, we're in Genesis, but Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy are coming. And it's the community rules. It's how do you take a group of people and and teach them what holiness and justice and righteousness and purity might look like. So they talk about personal hygiene and dietary rules and how to live in community because they didn't know that. They had to learn that. And a part of their instruction was Moses said, when you get into the land that flows with milk and honey, understand that there's a set of behaviors that will bring the blessings of God upon your life. And there's a set of blessings that will bring a curse upon your life. That you can walk out from under the grace and mercy of God and find yourself in a completely different circumstance. And you don't want to do that. He said, when you get into the promised land, I want you to go stand on two mountaintops. They're opposing one another. They're very near together. He said, I want half the people on one mountain and half the people on the other. And I want on one mountain, I want you to recite the blessings. And on the other mountain, I want you to recite the curses. I want you to have a dramatic visual image of this notion that your choices determine outcomes in your life. It's an essential part of the narrative. And it's one that we just have kind of set aside and go, oh, bother. I don't believe that. As if our refusal to believe it changes reality. If that really works, how about we all say together, I don't believe in the IRS. (laughs) You laugh, you don't think it'll work. Well, I promise you the eternal kingdom of God is more durable than the IRS. And yet we imagine that if we choose to refuse the belief that somehow we are delivered from the consequence. You understand that is absurd, right? In your notes is Deuteronomy 28. It's a chapter filled with both the blessings of God and the curses of God. And I edited a bit just to give you the highlights. This is just an introductory. But in the first verse of Deuteronomy 28, these are the blessings given because of the covenant God made with Abraham. And they're being spelled out to these Hebrew slaves hundreds of years later, that same covenant with Abraham is still in effect. You and I are participants in that Abrahamic covenant through our faith in Jesus. Did you know that? And so Deuteronomy 28 lists those blessings and curses. It says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And then there's a lengthy list. There's 12 verses that follow that that are filled with blessings. You'll be blessed in the city and the field when you sit and when you stand, when you come in and when you go out. It says your enemy will come before you one way and flee before you seven ways. It's an amazing list of blessings. But the tone changes in verse 15. It says, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and you don't carefully follow all his commands, and decrees that I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And it's the exact opposite of the previous list. You'll be blessed, you'll be cursed in the city and in the country. And the summary, I think, at least the the best synopsis to me in that lengthy verse, the, the curses are four times as long as the blessings. Because you didn't serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, Therefore, in hunger and thirst and nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies of the Lord sins against you. He'll put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. At this point, the skeptics want to raise their hand. And they'll say, you know, I, I don't believe merit has anything to do. I'm saved by grace. And that's a gift from God. You're absolutely right, Obi-Wan. We can't earn our way into the kingdom of God. But the choices of our lives will either bring the blessings of God upon us 
or take us out from under the blessings of God. So the choices you make have a great deal to do with the nature and circumstance of your existence under the sun. I'm not calling into question the covenant you have with God. All of these blessings and curses are being delivered to God's covenant people. The expectation is the line of demarcation, the differentiation is whether they choose to be obedient or they do not. Think of it this way. If you are standing in the atmosphere of the earth, you can take a deep breath and fill your lungs, which will supply your body with oxygen for a bit. If you put your face underwater, you'll have a harder time with that. That's not punishment. That's about the physical properties of the world in which we live. And God is so gracious to us that he has said to us, if you'll cooperate with me, if you'll, if you'll follow the pathway that I illuminate before you, it will bring the best possible things to your life. You'll be blessed everywhere you go in a tangible, physical way. I'll never forget a class I had at Vanderbilt in their graduate school. It was a class on the Hebrew Bible and the professor was not a particularly faith-filled person. And they said, you know, in the Bible, there's this notion that, that words have almost a tangible component to them. It's as if a word could impact you physically. Now that was the rational analysis of a biblical skeptic and you say, we want to withdraw from this notion because, well, I just don't believe God would. God would what? Keep you from breathing when you put your head underwater? If you're going to ignore the principles, you will suffocate until you finally fill your lungs with water. And that's going to have a very negative impact on your well being. It has nothing to do with fair or unfair, it's a principle. Well, there are spiritual principles and we have for the most part lived in ignorance of them or at least indifference to them. So, you know, I asked, no. And we have had so many blessings. We've had so much liberty and so much freedom and so much abundance that we could pretty much navigate a way for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. They could have food and medicine available to them and educational opportunities and they could travel a bit and experience life a little bit so we could navigate. Do you understand the vast majority of the world's population doesn't know anything about the kind of liberties and freedoms and opportunities that we have? And if you haven't been paying attention lately, they are dramatically, rapidly being diminished. Free speech has just about disappeared. Propaganda flourishes. Immorality is celebrated and godliness is mocked. I watched a television show and I got home last night for a little bit. I couldn't take it. Mocking a Christian worldview, doing their best to denigrate, humiliate people that would believe as I do. It's fair game in the public square. Are you watching? We're gonna to have to have the courage to say, I believe godliness is better. Why? I think it's a better way for a human being to, to live. We haven't had that courage, folks. We have capitulated and retreated and demurred. And we've been told to be tolerant until we find we don't have access to authority and those with the authority are very intolerant of our worldview. I will not yield to schools. I refuse to yield to college campuses. I know the... the Horizon doesn't look great right now, but why shouldn't Jesus be introduced back into those places? But it begins with what we believe. Obedience to God will bring a blessing and disobedience to God, you will walk out from under those blessings. If the word curse bothers you, okay, you can just live absent the blessing of God in the darkness alone with evil. See how that works. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you wanna be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.